So this has all been described up there in the start. Like introducing probability in the context of the dot motion task that you were all shown earlier. And Albert mentioned that in this task, even when you present the same stimulus many times, there's a correlation between the mean spike count and the animal decision shown. And I just wanted to, um, uh, no one's quite, uh, there's one point about the calculation of the cost that's worth mentioning, we're all on the same page. Um, uh, it's really a very, conceptually very simple. It's simply the probability that if you take a random pick from this distribution associated with one choice, that it's larger than a random pick from this distribution associated with this choice. And um, for that reason, it's, uh, is equivalent to the probability with which you will correctly predict the monkey's choice by knowing the spike counts in your one. And so um, the value observed in the original study and very typical for many of these was about 0.56. So it's a, it's a, it's a subtle but, but consistent relationship between the final rate of the neurons and the animal's choice. Um, and the question I want, uh, have been struggling with for some years now is where does this come from, this correlation? And there are uh, two um, extreme versions of the possibility. One is uh, what I call the course model. And that is that the animal is performing a threshold task. In order to do that, he has to make the most use of all the information in the neurons that represent the stimulus. Those neurons are noisy. And so noise in the activity of the neurons actually gets integrated into his judgments. So the noise in the neurons causes the judgment and hence causes the correlation. And um, this has been extremely well worked out quantitatively and provides a really beautiful account of the data. But that success doesn't necessarily exclude alternative explanations. And the other extreme is that just the causation goes the other way. That some aspect of the animal's decision or behavior actually causes changes in the firing rate of sensory neurons that, that generate the choice probability. Um, and I've argued for, uh, in the past that at least some component of the decision of uh, the choice probability is generated by this direction of causality. But it's been very difficult to say much quantitatively about what the bounds are on the contrib contribution made by these two mechanisms. And in order to try and get a handle on that, uh, I want to look more closely at the correlation matrix between neurons. Um, I want, yeah, we'll skip that. Um, and in order to understand why the correlation matrix is so um, valuable, it's useful to go back to this classic study that Mike did um, where he's, he formed a very simple hypothesis, which is that you pool all the activity of these neurons, and the, the decision made by the model is simply taken um, on which pool has the highest overall firing rate. And a very simple intu intuition you can get from this is if these pools are large, the correlation between any one neuron in this pool and this final decision has to be very small if these neurons are all independent. And for that reason, um, this gives rise to the result which has been mentioned a couple of times already, which is in order to observe substantial correlations between any one neuron here and the decision out here, it's necessary that the activity between neurons be correlated. Um, but an, uh, an even more important point in the context of discrimination tasks like this is it's not just good enough that neurons be correlated with one another. That, uh, that correlation has to reflect some other properties. So in this particular example, it's important that neurons within this pool are correlated and neurons within this pool are correlated, but, the, but the, that those should be larger at least than correlations between the pools. And that was, again, documented in the, in the simulation that Mike did, um, where, uh, for the purposes of this sim simple simulation, he set the correlation between neurons in opposite pools to zero, and explored what happens when you increase the correlation between neurons within a single pool. And um, what he showed is, if you go to plausibly large pool sizes, then the, the magnitude of the choice probability that you predict, which is this blue curve, um, uh, gradually reduces towards 0.5 if there's no correlation between neurons. But if you add a correlation coefficient of 0.15, you get substantially higher choice probabilities. And so, uh, oh, that's... <laughs> okay, we might... That should be red. It might just be... Never mind, it'll do. I'm just... Uh, it might cause more trouble later. This, for this slide, it's okay. Um, so, so now I want to represent um, that re result by drawing the whole correlation matrix that's being proposed. And before I say anything about it, um, this, at this stage, the model is obviously a very simple cartoon. No one meant to imply the, the correlation matrix really looked like this in the brain. But this very simple cartoon is very useful for understanding certain properties of the relationship between this matrix 
and the choice. And so uh, what's represented here is, is the preferred direction of individual neurons, and then this is the preferred direction of some second neuron. And so each pixel here represents the correlation coefficient between this neuron and that neuron. And the structure of the matrix they used for that simulation was that, um, uh, let's start here. So for neurons with the same preferred direction, both liking up, they have a correlation value, which I'm going to call R within. And all the neurons in the up pool, so here within 90 degrees of that direction, have this correlation. And similarly, all the neurons within the down pool have this correlation. Whereas neuronal pairs that, that cross that pool boundary have a correlation of zero. Um, um, and so the two things I want to point out about having a matrix like this. And the first is um, that although these correlations are frequently described as noise correlations, because they're measured across repeated presentations of the same stimulus, um, that doesn't mean we know that they are generated by noise. We don't know where they come from. What this matrix tells you is that um, there is some input which is uh, common to these neurons, which is not common across these pools. But it says that the simulation says nothing about what the origin of that common input is. It just means that there is some common input. And the other thing that is worth noting about um, this particular simulation, as you go to a very large N, you have a large population of neurons, all of which have the same pairwise correlation with one another. There's essentially only one way to generate that, which is to add a single signal, to generate random numbers for each neuron and then add one single signal to all of them. And so, um, uh, the, 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 the question I posed earlier about whether this represents a causal noise in the neurons causing decisions or a top-down signal turns into a question only about where does that common signal come from? What is the origin of the common signal that drives this correlation? And I think to date there's really no empirical data that constrains that. The possibilities are all open. Um, and uh, one other thing that I'd like to point out about this diagram is, um, again, within the context of this cartoon, it's that common signal which drives this correlation which is responsible for the choice probability. So if you go back to the model, the signal which drives the decision here is simply the difference between the common signal you add to these two pools. And so in the context of this model, what that means is the correlation between choice and neuronal firing you observe in MT isn't caused by the randomness of any firing rate within MT, it's simply transmitting a signal which, which all the neurons receive, which has come into MT. And so it may reflect random activity of some neurons causing choice, but it's not random activity of MT neurons that causes that choice in the context of this model. Um, so it's just that this correlated, whatever causes the correlation is a signal that's transmitted through MT. Okay. Um, now, so the first problem with this cartoon being obviously oversimplified is if I simply change the task and now make it a left-right pool, now my left pool sits here and my right pool now straddles the corners of the box, um, I need to propose a different correlation matrix to explain the choice probability. And so, um, obviously this is an approximation, but it's important to recognize that if you think of the correlation matrix as representing something like connectivity and shared affluence, then um, it should be a fixed co uh, correlation matrix that shouldn't change with the task. Uh, and people often haven't thought about what that fixed correlation matrix would look like and whether the data is really compatible with that. Um, it's trivial to do, and I'm sure this is what was always intended. If I have a correlation matrix which is like this, so that neurons with identical preferred directions have the highest correlation, and as you go away from this identity line, the correlation gets weaker and weaker, that will generate choice probabilities just fine. Um, and so uh, this is... You know, the natural way to think about the data. Mateo. Yeah, uh, yes, I did, don't I? Yes, you're quite right. Yes. Yes. Um, okay. Um, so, uh, so now I want to think about so um, so this is the natural way to use a correlation matrix to generate choice probability, I think, in the traditional way. Um, but now I want to think about what this correlation might, matrix might look like if uh, something like a top-down signal was involved. Um, or put it the other way, um, what are the properties, yeah, what properties should we expect to see uh, 
in this matrix if it's really caused just by something like shared absence. And one is that the, the correlation you see between a pair of neurons should depend on their difference in preferred direction, but it shouldn't depend on the absolute direction preference, which is why this, with this uh, matrix has a diagonal symmetry. And the second thing which is related to that point is it should have a fixed structure. It shouldn't be dependent on a task in structure. Whereas um, the top-down mechanism, which I propose plays some role, could in principle violate both of these. And so that's really what I want to do. That gives you a, that gives you a handle on measuring it, which I particularly like because it avoids complicated semantic arguments about what is top-down and what is bottom-up. Um, if, I can, if I can measure a component of the correlation matrix which is variable with task instruction, then that's not bottom-up. That's all I want to call it. Um, and so that's really my objective. And before doing that, it's worth uh, getting specific about a possible top-down cause. I'm not strongly wedded to this view. It's just an easy way for me to think about it because it's concrete. And the way I think about it is subject deploy feature-based attention when they're doing threshold psychophysics. You look at a noisy stimulus, you inquire whether that's up or down, and when you do that, you actually engage feature-based attention to uplift or downlift. And the effect of um, feature-based attention is to increase the firing rate of all the neurons in the up pool um, while reducing the firing rate of all the neurons in the down, roll, down pool. So that, that generates correlations with exactly the structure you need for the matrix. Um, yeah, so introduce a positive correlation between, within pools and negative correlation between pools. And so uh, if I, again, uh, get even more concrete and assume that that feature-based uh, signal is some Gaussian function of what the neurons tuning is relative to the feature being attended, it predicts a correlation matrix like this. So let's imagine the animal's um, doing an up-down task. And so what feature-based attention means is on some trials he makes all these neurons fire more and all these neurons fire less. So that will generate positive correlations between neurons that both like um, 90 degrees, but negative correlations over here between neurons that belong to opposite pools. Is that a feature-based or a um, Do I want to differentiate those two? Provi providing the effect is just to increase the firing rate of all neurons with a common... I mean, the, the bias can... You can implement a bias purely at the decision stage without it changing the firing rate of sensory neurons, right? Um, Another way to answer that question is uh, you could use this kind of attentional mechanism to implement a bias. Yes, if you use this attentional mechanism, it should introduce a bias. Yes, exactly. Um, okay, so, so it generates this matrix with a, with a very different shape. But, but more importantly, the shape of this matrix is going to change with the task. So now think about what happens if we give the animal a left-right task. Now the positive correlation will have to be between neurons that like um, 0 or 180. So you get a matrix of the same shape, but it's been translated in this space. And so um, a, a top-down mechanism like this would have to produce a correlation matrix that changes with the task. And so that's the central question I want to look at. And before doing that, uh, there's a very nice study pub published some time ago which shows that there must be changes in the correlation matrix with task. And this was a very elegant study by Cohen Newsom, where um, while the animals did the same dots task we've already discussed, um, she recorded from pairs of neurons with different preferred directions. And then she chose two different tasks carefully according to the neurons preferred direction. Um, so let's suppose the neurons were plus or minus 45 at this one. If the animal's doing an up-down task, then both neurons belong to the same pool. Whereas if the animal now does a left right task, now these neurons belong to opposite pools. And what Marlene showed is the correlations you measure between these neurons depends what pool they're in. So they're the same, it's the same neuronal pair, you change the task so they're in different pools, and the correlation changes. So that means that there is a variable component to the correlation matrix. Um, um, but they didn't measure the whole correlation matrix, they're just looking at single pairs, and that limits how much you can say about the consequences of this for choice probability. In order to understand that, I want to place their data into one of these correlation matrices. So let's imagine they were, uh, she recorded from a pair of neurons with preferences close to vertical. So her first task would be an up-down task here. And so that would give you a sample point here in the matrix. And then um, she's going to give us a second task, um, which is now left-right. And, and remember, that what that does um, is to change the location of this matrix. So that for the left-right task, the matrix is now up here. And now that the neurons don't change their preference, so this, the point is 
still live on the, in the space, but a different part of the graph. And so that gives you a, a sample when they belong to different pools. And so uh, we can repeat this process with another pair of neurons with more different orientations. And so now uh, my neurons sit over here. And so in the same pool pass, that gives me a sample at this point. And then if I change the task that's left to right, um, that will now give me a sample here in the matrix. Okay? And so if you, you can see that across all possible sets, the, the, the data they generated constitute two lines, uh, cross-sections through these parts of the matrix. So the way they did the experiment meant they only sampled the small part of the matrix. Um, now, for the particular matrix I'm proposing, these would be very valuable samples, and you could estimate the, the magnitude of this matrix just from their data. They wisely didn't attempt to do that. And um, th the biggest problem, I think, with trying to do that is, first of all, obviously, you're making an assumption about the structure of the matrix which you haven't measured. But I think much more importantly, you're making a very strong assumption which underlies a lot of this work about the animal's behavior. And that is, you're assuming that when you give the animal two different tasks, he does exactly the two tasks you do. And that often isn't the case. And I'm going to uh, go and show you that in a moment for a different task. Um, and, uh, and the consequences of that, for, the, for what I want to get out of this matrix, are rather devastating. Because if the animal does a slightly different task, the matrix is displaced here. And that means you're no longer sampling the part of the matrix you thought you were. And so if there's any variability in the task the animal is actually doing, then you can't infer the shape of this matrix from their measurements. You're looking very puzzled. Yeah, so, so in on one of these tasks, you did different possibilities of the animals doing a different strategy for the two different conditions? Uh, uh, yes. Uh, so, 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 so let me restate that. Okay. Her assumption is the animal's using two different strategies for, the same, for different conditions, which are appropriate. Right? She's supposing when she, she assumes that here, yeah. they're really differentiating, they're pooling exactly like this, and that here, they're pooling like this. So the animal's strategy is to do what you're asking to, but they may be doing something intermediate. <coughs> right? Um, but which it can't be totally intermediate because otherwise she wouldn't have found it. Right? Yes, yes, it can't be it can't be totally intermediate. Yeah. Yeah. It would be a little bit down. Yeah, so uh, um, that, that's a question I'd like to return to once I've shown you some data. And you can, you can try and think about how smeared out it might be. And, and, think, and I, <laughs> I think the short answer is it could be quite a lot smeared out. Um, but we can return to that. So a quick summary of where I've got to, because this is before I show you any of my data. So a structured correlation matrix is essential for observing choice probability. Uh, the the, the top-down signals I postulate would modulate this structure in a way that depends on the task. But in order to measure this, you need to know both what the correlation matrix looks like and you need to know exactly what task the animal is forming in order to quantify the contribution of this choice probability. So in order to do that, um, I went to uh, a different task which is similar in principle, um, but it was motivated by the wish to be able to do all of this in V1 where uh, array recording technologies are more practical. And so, how am I doing for time? Okay, I'm going to skip over this. So, but I'm not. So, the, 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 uh, I'm going to skip over this very quickly. So, it's just an orientation discrimination task where it's a noise sample that's passed through a filter, and I vary the orientation bandwidth of the filter. So, in the limiting case shown, I'll show you some. Skip this. Um, so, this shows you uh, different stimuli. So, uh, here you can see the, the filter's fairly narrow, so you can see that this is vertically oriented. Here, the, the, it's not, uh, that's much easier than the stimuli the animal ever sees. Um, and here, it's a circular filter, so there's no uh, information on average in these stimuli. And the animal, um, uh, and then the, the other filter would have horizontal power, and the animal simply reports vertical or horizontal. Um, okay. Um, so, um, uh, so the first thing I need to do is to be able to quantify what, I th quantify what task the animal is doing. In order to do that, we ported a technique from human psychophysics called psychophysical reverse correlation. And so here we simply take all of those stimuli where the animal reported vertical and all those stimuli where the animal reported horizontal and, and uh, take the average power, Fourier power spectrum uh, of each of these. So uh, then this shows you real data. So this is the average power spectrum associated with all the vertical choices. And this is the power spectrum associated with all horizontal choices. 
And this just takes the difference between the two, which then summarizes the animal's behavior. And um, in fact, I'm going to collapse it a little bit more and average across all spatial frequencies. So I'm going to take radial sums through this to plot um, the, the orientation power in this image for each orientation. And this, and this basically measures the, the, the orientations the animal is actually reporting. So fluctuations in the stimulus energy here and here are what are driving his choices. So that's actually the orientation of the task axis he's using. And that's a very sensible looking kernel. That, that, that's a very sensible thing for an animal to do. And here is the rub. So that's the circular mean orientation of his kernel. Those are the discriminanda for the task he was set that day. Right, so he's absolutely way off. Um, now, uh, this is not for a random reason. This is because at this point we'd understood what was going on. We knew, as I'll show you in a second, they're actually very slow to change what task they do. And so we exploited that in generating this kernel. So pr prior to this, he'd been doing a different task for a few days. And, on this, and this was his first day using these new discriminanda. It's important to note this is a highly trained animal who had been doing this for over a year by now. So this isn't his first experience of this switch. And then uh, this then shows you, um, what I'm going to show you is a plot of where this peak goes day by day. And so this shows you over the course of, it takes something like 10 days for him to rotate his kernel to be appropriate for the new task. And by the end of those 10 days, he's now got a sensible correlation matrix. But he's, well, we can talk, into why, we can talk about why they might do this, but it's crazy. Um, but it's a real problem. So, so in order to uh, make use of this, what we've done is spent several days training the animal. Then we will record in the way in here and, and uh, make measurements of the kernel both on the day and before and after without changing his task. And then we spend the week or a few days rotating his kernel back again and then we do another array recording so that we can sample different, um, real different psychophysical states. Um, and then while we do this, I'm going to skip this, um, uh, we've recorded uh, moderate-sized populations of neurons with two different technologies, either these um, uh, plextrode laminar arrays with 24 contacts in one animal, and in, in the other animal we have a 96 electrode Utah array implanted in his V1. And um, then it, uh, uh, in order to collapse these data across sessions, we take into account his actual kernel on that day. So if this is the data for one session, and his, the, the peak of the kernel lies here, in order to uh, represent these data, I'm going to rotate these data so that uh, the peak is always in the same place relative to the kernel. So, so this, um, and if this is the second day's data where the kernel's here, I'll rotate that also. So that now these axes become the preferred orientation of the neuron minus the kernel orientation. And then when I do that and collapse all the data, uh, we have um, 1,200 pairs. Um, and this shows you the empirical correlation matrix. Um, because this data is, is circular, it's periodic in both dimensions, uh, I always find these plots very confusing, and I find it much easier to see the circular structure if I, multiple, if I just show the same matrix over and over again. Plus, that makes the data look much more impressive, right? Four times as much. <laughs> um, but, but lest you think I'm cheating, I'm just going to draw a box here to show you this is one unique, unique data set. The rest is just for illustration. Um, uh, that's the identity line running down and to the right. Uh, and one thing you can see is um, <laughs> this doesn't fit neatly with either prediction. Um, it's certainly not a symmetric matrix. Uh, clearly, there are changes going on. And there are peaks roughly where we'd expect. So this shows you the peak. This is zero. So this is the, the, the center of the within task pools. And this trough here is quite close to the cross task, the cross task orientations. Um, so in order to try and quantify that, um, we, uh, we uh, actually fit it with two uh, matrices. One is, which, one is just a circular Gaussian along this direction, and the other is uh, a Gaussian of the type I showed you earlier, where this is uh, just a two-dimensional Gaussian with one SD, and then this is just the, the negative product of those two. So it's really just two Gaussians that define, one Gaussian defines this matrix, and one Gaussian defines that matrix. And that fit does a pretty good job of accounting for the data. Uh, and what that fit tells us, which you can, I should emphasize this because it's not obvious, uh, this modulation that you can see, first of all, is quite a bit weaker than this one, but this, the, the fitted value of this fixed matrix is actually the wrong way around. This has negative correlation along the main diagonal and positive correlation between different neurons. So the fixed component that we see in our matrix is uh, unexpected. Um, and so 
What that means is if you ask about what the contribution of these two matrices is to choice probability, this one actually shifts choice probability the wrong way. Um, my suspicion is this isn't real. Um, 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 so I, I don't want to emphasize too much this quantitative measure, but these matrix suggest that it's largely the variable component of the correlation matrix which generates choice probability. It happens to have the same data with the animals not doing the task. Um, we have a bunch of data with animals doing the task. I haven't, we haven't pl plotted the correlation matrices yet. Um, yeah, it's slightly complicated what they're doing when they're not doing the task. Um, but we have a variety of estimates of that. Um, I should probably stop there. I'm going to stop there. That's just another way of quantifying the same thing. Um, so choice probability depends on correlated activity between neurons. And that correlation has to be higher within pools than between pools. And this uh, structure implies that members of a pool receive some common signal which isn't derived from the stimulus. Um, and that common signal clearly changes with task, as was shown by Cohen and Newsom. Uh, and what we've shown is if you use psychophysical reverse correlation, which allows you to measure what task the animal is actually doing, and then align the data that way, the correlation matrices, matrices show a structure which implies that the bulk of the choice probability is driven by signals that change with the animal's task. Uh, and to my mind, that suggests they're what you would call top-down. Um, and so, although CP reflects a mixture of top-down and bottom-up factors, um, that produce interneuronal correlations. Even in D1, it, uh, our data at present at least, suggests that the top-down ones produce the largest part. Um, I want to emphasize that uh, we have quite a bit more data to add to this. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if that balance changes. I think what I want to emphasize for now is by measuring this correlation matrix at the same time as knowing what task the animal is doing, uh, you have a method which allows these two things to be separated at least in principle. Um, I wouldn't want to commit yet to the fact that the bottom-up one has no influence at all. I think that's unlikely. Um, but I think the, the method should allow us to answer that question. So, um, in order to, uh, um, <laughs> the, the animal certainly has biases that change from day to day, but, you, but that's not good enough, right? You, you, you would have separated into the trials in a given session with and without a bias um, in order to answer your question. And my, I'm not sure how I'm going to do that. I could do the kind of thing that Marlene did with her array recordings where I predict the bias state from the yeah, recordings. But then to look back at the correlation matrix having fitted up that way, that's a bit circular. I could certainly try that. Um, I, I could look at sequential dependencies as a predictor of bias. You're going to hear a bit about that in single neuron data later from Henrique, but we have not yet done that for these. So, so I just want to propose a topic for conversation for later, because this is, I want to take advantage of having Shadman coming in the same room, because uh, in the Britain and our paper, Visual Neuroscience 96, So in the discussion, they say, of course, choice probabilities could, could be top down. They don't use these words. And they, they say, but we lean toward the bottom up explanation. We don't use that word. Because, and they list three or four reasons. The only one I remember now is the timing of the choice probability and the fact that it develops very quickly. Yep. And you published a paper instead with Enrique, I think, yep. saying that they develop late. Unless I remember things about it. Anyway, I just want to know how historically we went from leaning completely from bottom up I think actually that particular point Mike and I would now agree about and Mike said something earlier so so um, the idea that the, the, the chief thing isn't how quickly they arise it's the fact they persist constantly to the end of the trial which which suggests that you're which is what you get out of a bottom-up model if you integrate them perfectly and then what's, what's definitely changed in many people's thinking, I think Mike's included, is we now believe the animals probably don't continue integrating until the end of the trial. And if the animal is no longer integrating sensory information at the end of the trial, then choice probabilities should decline. And, and so, they did not decline. And they didn't decline. So ironically, if you take the data in the Vietnam Tal paper with a modern understanding of what we think the animals were doing, which is what we measured psychophysically, then that's more of a problem for the bottom-up 
than an advantage. Would you agree with that? No. <laughs> so, uh, no. <laughs> so, we so we can discuss it. I'd be happy. Yeah, it'd be great. Yeah, yeah. Can I think about Yeah. Uh, yep, so, so, um, so in the vestibular nucleus, I don't know if the top-down thing is there or not, but, but I do think a really important difference between those subcortical studies is you don't, um, you're not dealing with nearly such large populations, right? So it's not clear to me that the correlation argument is so powerful, right? There are not millions of neurons down there. I see, okay. You might have a large trace probability despite the lack yes. of... Yes, yes. And the high trace probabilities are only in the vestibular task. And so, so I also really worry about end organ noise there. So I don't think they've yet published anything on there. I know they have now looked at primary afferents, and apparently it's not there. But that's also very complicated because they don't have such a straightforward representation. Right, there's this rotation of the, of the coordinate space between the primary afferents and the vestibular yeah, nucleus. Yeah, right, so um, I, think that's a very, I don't think that determines it yet. We haven't looked at that yet. No, and 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 that. that and if it's shared with good noise, it should it should be fast in in a zero delay. If it's uh, top down, it should be slower. I mean, it, it could be, but it depends whether it represents a bias or something that's evolved during the task. Yeah. Um, but the answer is uh, we don't have enough data to start splitting it up like that and have reliable answers yet. If it, if it was there by itself, right, but it, but it could be superimposed okay. in the background. Um, um, uh, not, not, not much, no, just barely, just barely, but, yeah, yeah. So this, yeah, the one with the red here, blue here. Yeah. So that's the one that accounts for the choice probability for data. But it's very, a very inefficient coding strategy given the full model, right, because what you should do Correlate positively cells which have negative signal correlation. So what you know, I take it that the data forces that measure on us, but it's a really bad idea to do things out of it, right? Yep. So that's one of um, uh, you know, I don't have a good answer to that yet, but, but one one um, important complication this whole thing raises is once you uh, if you say that part of this correlation matrix is under the animal's control then it's no longer clear that when they decode the matrix, they're unaware of what they've done. Right? So if you know that what you've done is to change, if you know you've just added a correlation to the matrix, then you'd have to be, it, it might be easy to say, well, I'm not, I can factor that out when I read out. Um. Okay, thank you. Thank you.